I came to meet Mickey because um, I was involved in inviting the Gyutu monks, uh, the, which it means the Upper Tantric College of Lhasa, who had reestablished themselves at that time in a town called Dalhousie, not far from Dharamsala. And I had been working with the abbot of that monastery, Tara Toku, as a major teacher of mine. The Dalai Lama had assigned him to help me translate some very difficult books. And I received initiations from them, and I was very close. I was sort of an honorary, um, honorary monk of that monastery, although I was no longer a monk at that point. I was a layman. And um, uh, so uh, I, we helped bring them here. And then they had this multiphonic, what we call multiphonic chanting, where they have a very deep voice and they have these high overtones. And so we were helping it on a tour with them and then the tour was only here in the East Coast. And somehow, I, I don't remember how I contacted Mickey, but I heard that he was really interested in the ethnographic sort of things and, and recording unusual things. And we appealed to him to organize a Western leg of the tour, California leg of the tour. And he did. He did a great uh, concert for the monks, and he got to like them. And then he recorded them in a, in a fabulous studio in Berkeley. And he issued that early tape. So all around all of that and helping with the knowledge of it. Houston Smith was also somewhat involved. I think maybe Houston Smith was the link. The well-known religion scholar Houston Smith also had a very nice relationship with that Utah monastery, also from the 60s like mine. And um, so he told Mickey, somehow he knew Mickey, and he told about these monks, you know, and Mickey had seen a film that he made about the monk. So somehow we linked up, and then we took the monks there with Mickey, and then we brought them again a number of times, and the Grateful Dead as a whole became friendly with the Guto Monastery, Danny Rifkin, Bobby Weir, and others, as well as Mickey, and it was a long and wonderful relationship. The Guto uh, trained uh, chanting lama is often very sought after by the other big monasteries to be what they call the umze, the leading, the chant leader, the chant master. And in a way, none of them have quite, some of them have a more high pitched kind of, there are other multiphonic things, some more high pitched ones. But the Gyutu one is really unique and specific, particular, and, the, and everyone respects it. It's kind of thought of as the great thing, the, great, the greatest voice in Tibetan Buddhism, you could say. I used to tell the people to visualize themselves being in a sacred space and with sort of jewel energies all around them and with enlightened beings swirling in the jewel energies and just sort of imagine that as they listen to the sound and that, that, that as long as they didn't conceive some sort of negative feeling about it, it was not the betrayal of some sort of initiatory thing or anything like that and it was, could be accepted and received as a blessing if they had a favorable attitude about it. So that's how I used to do it. And actually, the esoteric right that should be only granted to someone fit to receive that initiation with prerequisite understandings takes all day or several days. <laughs> so like a 20-minute bunch of chants or just little segments. They're little, you know, uh, illustrative segments of these rites. And they convey a blessing. And they even had the tradition in Tibet that they would go somewhere where there'd been a flood or an earthquake or someone had died or was sick and they would just perform for that family. Of course, they were a Buddhist family and so on. So, but still, they, they weren't people who were doing those practices. So it got to, it became so famous that it was just felt to be a tremendous blessing to hear it. And therefore, they were kind of like Westminster, you know, the boys' choir at Westminster. They were the royal choir. They were the Dalai Lama, one of the Dalai Lama choirs and they would go at, to different places and perform that, even in Tibet. And it was considered they would help the weather, they would like please the local spirits, you know, not to bring floods or things, you know what I mean? They, it was really like that. So they just did that around the world, that's all. They were actually wonderful ambassadors. And people had visions while they listened to it, very many. It would, I mean, the ones who would report it, I guess, maybe probably some didn't. But it was, uh, when they did live performances, their tours, they were really quite, I was surprised personally. Well, Mickey even used to always say, especially within the group, the drummer is the one who's, because of the rhythm, uh, synchronizing with the heartbeat and with the blood flow in the, in the, in the audience, is the one who's, lift, who's moving, who's the engine of the transportation. You know, then the singers and the other musicians are, are doing other things in the brain, but the, the thumb, the beat, you know, is the, is the drummer. So he's the transporter himself, <laughs> he used to say, which I agree with. And, um, but the, the band as a whole, that the Grateful Dead and the Utah monks are in the same 
business of doing transportation of people is correct. And, the, and of course, the transportation is to move them out of their habitual, rigid identity into some sort of higher vision, feeling connected to other beings and to the universe in a positive way, seeing the possibility of love and compassion dominating over hatred and violence and, irrit and horrible things in the world. I think this is true. And artists, the, the, the monks are like artists, in that, especially tantric monks, are like artists in that sense, in that you see, an enlightened being sees the world as a beautiful place, and they see beings as made out of bliss, actually. And that's why they, and even if the being thinks it's suffering, the enlightened being sees them as confused about their true nature. And there's really, the bliss in their selves is, is, uh, is what's real about them. And the way they have tortured themselves by getting freaked out by I'm separate from somebody or something's hurting me or I'm like this, that's part of their confusion. And so what the enlightened beings drive is, altruistic drive, is to help those beings see that they are okay and they are actually fine and, and turn to the, seeing the positive side of their existence. And the, the, first, the way you have to begin to do that is you have to stimulate the imagination of the being because they're so stuck in their habitual perception of the inadequacy of the world and of themselves and they can't, it's hard for them to imagine something being more magnificent. Yamantika is Manjushri, the Bodhisattva of perfect wisdom, and uh, therefore it is the realization of selflessness, is what it is. It's the compassion arising, it's the fierce compassion, you could say, arising from the realization of selflessness. But, and of course the chants associated with it have to do with the initiation of it and the whole practice of this, what's called the sadhana or the performance of visualizing the temple, the, the temple and visualizing yourself as Yamantaka actually. And so the one that they do when they perform it externally is just a small fragment of it containing like a drop, you know, of the ocean of that, of that, that practice. So that's what Yamantaka is and it's, a, it's wisdom of uh, selflessness, transforming death into eternal life and through compassion and love for beings. Love and compassion meaning the wish for beings to be happy and not to suffer. Then uh, Mahakala is a little different. Mahakala is a, the mythical origin of Mahakala is that he was a demon who had some special boons from uh, the high gods like Brahma and Shiva and Vishnu and so on. And he was bothering the rest of the universe because no one could defeat him. <laughs> And then, so then they appealed to the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, and Manjushri and Avalokiteshvara, the Bodhisattvas of wisdom and compassion, entered into the picture, and they sort of did, they got him cooled down. They never kill demons in Buddhism. The Buddhist deities never destroy demons. What they do is they hold them down and then they lecture them. <laughs> they do chants and performances and they, until they change their mind, open their hearts and stop being demons. Because it's no fun to be a demon, actually. It's more fun to be enlightened. So that's what they did with Mahakala. And then Mahakala, who is usually depicted in very fierce, various fierce forms, um, he uh, became uh, a protector also, like Yama did. And he is a very important one. And he's, always, he's been a protector for so long, since Buddha's time, that he's almost enlightened now. He's almost a Bodhisattva, even though he still maintains a kind of dark-looking, fierce form, Mahakala. So the Mahakala chant is a chant invoking the protector qualities and energies of Mahakala. And it's a little more mundane, therefore. It's like, protect the good people, protect the people who are being loving and altruistic, stand against the dark side people, uh, don't let them interfere with positive uh, work and things that are happening. And uh, so Mahakala is expected to respond to that. And so when they do again do that as a chant, what they sort of, what they used to tell people to visualize when I would introduce their concerts, is they, um, uh, uh, you know, they think about being safe and they think about being secure and they think about the good guys are really strong. You know, we have a kind of attitude in uh, our society that goodness is weak and the, the nasty and Thrasimachus, you know, in Plato are, the power, are powerful, you know, the evil, the evil doers are powerful. But the Buddhism does not have that view because they've taken evil doers and turned them into protectors of the good. And the Mahakala is a kind of a little snippet of that. The Chinese uh, destroyed their monasteries. They killed many of the monks. They imprisoned many others for many decades. 
A few escaped to India, not very many, and then they recruited new monks in India. One of the remarkable things His Holiness the Dalai Lama has done in India is he has kept the Tibetan culture alive by showing the beauty and importance and social attractiveness, actually, of the monastic lifestyle. And therefore, they still, even in exile, they might have 20 plus percent people are monastics monks or nuns, which you'd think in exile they'd all quit and they'd all want to have like families and et cetera because they're suffering genocide from the Chinese. But actually they maintain the, the monastic presence, the presence of people who are living at, trying to live at that little higher level of ethics and mind control and insight uh, is very important in the way the Tibetan culture clusters around it. And he's kept that in India, so they rebuilt in a way the tradition in India. And they have a big center now, Gyuta does, in Dharamsala, and they still maintain one they had in East India. I think they gave up the one in Dalhousie, but, um, but they're still a vibrant, uh, very, very vibrant tradition. Presently, the, His Holiness the Karmapa is living in the Gyuta Monastery in uh, Dharamsala. The Gyuta one within the Tibetan one is one of the most spectacular and extraordinary things. And to have that preserved by the Smithsonian, you know, Indiana Mickey, as I sometimes used to tease him, in the sound realm, you know, he's not finding skull, crystal skulls in Mexico, but he's finding amazing sound. And the fact that this is something that is uniquely Tibetan and that is honored in the Smithsonian and honored by Mickey and made known around the world is tremendous, it's wonderful. And it's, very, it's a very important thing. And the aggregate of this type of thing, uh, public recognition of the Tibetans' unique contribution to the tapestry of world cultures, and people loving it, actually, and therefore is respecting and loving Tibetan culture and realizing that it's something unique and something to be preserved, is in the long run the way of preserving it. And that's the way of, of saving Tibet, actually, in the long run, and the Tibetan people. So it's immensely important. We're very, the Tibetans are very grateful for, to Mickey for recording it and making it known. And this act of putting it in some sort of archive in the Smithsonian is also very, very helpful and wonderful. And Tibet House also supports it. I think the Gyuta monks themselves, probably the old timers particularly, I would say, maybe, all, maybe the new timers too, they probably imagined that Mickey in a previous life was a Gyuta monk. Oh.